Next up, C here met up with Nick Sturley, who has Usher syndrome. He's written a new book that was recently published entitled Innocence of Oppression. We went along to find out more. It's a controversial story set in an oral boarding school with deaf boys in the late 1970s. It centres on the close relationship between two teenage deaf boys and what they learn from both their friendship and the paths taken by other characters within the story. It encompasses a wide range of issues, giving insight into humour. It's thought-provoking and highlights potential psychological damage. Then a new male oral teacher from hell arrives and he develops a blind hatred of sign language. The story builds to include staff politics, unexpected revelations, shocking suppression of sign language and the boy's burning hatred of the oral teacher from hell. All of which culminates in a destructive climax which changes the school forever. The oral teachers were wrong, Chris said calmly. They were all wrong. No, Hubert leaned forward, rocking his head to and fro. Not wrong really, they simply didn't understand. Some are good, some are bad, but they all believed in um, a truth that was formed by too many lies. We heard a rumour that Nick uh, was writing a second book, a follow-up to Milan, and we purposefully looked for him and approached him and said, you know, can we take your work to print? What we were looking for with this book was an opportunity for someone to document the deaf educational experience um, from the deaf side, but also for hearing people to understand what um, schooling was like, what the deaf educational experience was like for deaf children, how isolated they were, how marginalised they were, and how disenfranchised they were. A major part of the process as I started writing the story was recognising the enormous potential for developing the characters. I started by categorising the characters. For the key roles, I considered how to develop their backgrounds and issues and things like that. I felt I should make the story as realistic as possible and decided to meet many deaf people from a variety of backgrounds. This was done through face-to-face -face discussions, through email, on Facebook, chatting with family, and people sending me their experiences about their background, family life, and education. What people told me helped me a great deal. I had lots of problems because I was always you know, like the only deaf one in the family. No one to talk to. Isolated, Aaron said, noting Chris's furrowed eyebrows. It means you feel lonely and trapped. It's what you just said. You're the only deaf boy in the house and you had no one to talk to. That's isolation. My inspiration for writing this story came from a dream I had a while ago. In this dream, I remember seeing two boys, one blonde-haired and the other dark-haired. These later became Aaron and Chris. In the dream, they're both sitting down on the grass, signing to each other. Behind them is their boarding school. This image stayed with me and became fixed in my mind. Although I tried to ignore it, I couldn't forget the image and decided to pick it up and plant it as the seed of my story. The story gradually built up with more and more characters and grew and grew. But it all came from my dream. During his first class, Aaron sat in the middle of a semicircular formation of ten wooden desks, facing the teacher's desk and the blackboard. He looked round the English room as it was called, it was a fairly large classroom with a high ceiling and two large double-framed windows on one side. The hardest part of writing the book, I think I had to write it like a novel. I almost had to play every character, like an actor, 
taking on each of their personas to develop their character and dialogue. This was hard, because there are so many characters, and some of them were difficult to write about, because their stories are so highly emotive, they had a deep emotional impact. For example, stories involving swearing, or fighting, or sexual situations. So if I needed to write about arguing in the story, I would argue it out in sign with myself and type it up. It sounds mad, but it helped me to create a dialogue, and I used that in the story. It was tough for me. It made me feel mentally and emotionally drained. C here was interested to find out what members of the deaf community think of Innocence of Oppression. When I started reading the book, I read chapter one, then chapters two and three, and I realised it was quite dark and that something was going on. It was a bit depressing and a struggle to read, but then I realised these chapters were important in really setting the framework for the whole story. After that, the book soon began to pick up. Lots of things happened and there were many twists and turns. I began to identify with the different characters and through Nick's fantastic descriptions, I could picture the halls and the different settings. He is skilled at describing things from a deaf perspective. He really does write in a way that deaf people see and think about things, which is amazing. And so once I was hooked, I couldn't put the book down until it was finished. When I read the book, it reminded me of my experience in boarding school. Mostly, English lessons were not too bad for me, but I did have problems with some teachers and some other pupils. It's all there in the book. The book talks about our history. It's all there. And it's definitely really important because society needs to know what happened in the past and why deaf people suffered. They didn't notice what was going on with deaf people. We were seen as being silent. Hearing people didn't know that we had these problems. They just thought we were naughty. But the problems were real. Aaron felt as though his head was suddenly twice as heavy. The red padding was already hurting his ears and the heavy curved steel strap was bearing down on top of his head. He bent his head down, taking the weight of the headphones with him and tentatively turned the on-off knob. Suddenly a loud blare shot through his ears, making his eardrums tingle. Aaron jumped from his chair in shock and quickly looked down at the control panel to discover that the volume knob was at the maximum setting of six. He turned it to one and his still ringing ears embraced the complete silence. He began to hate them already. The response has been significant and, and that can be seen from the sales of the book. Half the print one's been sold already. Um, we're in discussion uh, with partners in the US for overseas rights. Um, people have said to us, you know, this, this, is, this is an amazing piece of work and well done Nick for putting down the deaf experience in the way, shape and form he has. Others have said to us, you know, some of what's gone on here must never happen again. Um, so, so clearly uh, the response has been powerful and, and it's been, you know, what we look to achieve to get people thinking, talking, uh, and assessing you know, the deaf educational experience. What are my plans for the future? Innocence of Oppression was a huge undertaking, which took up a massive amount of my time. I think now I need a break from big projects, and I'd like to get back and focus on my first love, which is script writing. But at the same time, I'd really like to write books for deaf children. I already have a children's book project on the shelf, so maybe I'll take it down and carry on with that. Wow, what an epic novel. We'd be interested in your views on it. Well, that's it for this week. We hope you enjoyed today's programme. See you next week. Bye.